Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to City Hall. I hope everyone enjoyed their breakfast. Wasn't it fantastic? Yes, good. Good morning. Uh, my name is Su Ling Ching and I'm the uh, proud President and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade. On behalf of myself, Mayor Jim Watson, I only get to see that two more times, Mayor Jim Watson, um, the Ottawa Board of Trade and the Ottawa Business Journal, please, please uh, have a wonderful morning here with us at the Mayor's Breakfast. What a great crowd we have this morning. This is pre-pandemic numbers, so we're so excited to have over 200 of you here in this room this morning. I am joined this morning by, with, uh, by my co-presenter, Michael Curran, of course, who is the publisher of the Ottawa Business Journal, and we're so thrilled to be here, safely gathered together in this beautiful city hall. Thank you for being here this morning and investing your time and energy in the growth of our business community and the building of our city. A big thank you to the staff team at City Hall for hosting us and working with us to ensure everyone is comfortable. Can we give them a big round of applause? This morning, I would like to welcome three leaders who serve on our board of directors, Ian Sherman of Relationship Capital, Aaron Benjamin of the Canadian Live Music Association, and Devinder Chaudhry of Ayana Restaurant Collective. Thank you for your steadfast leadership and your dedication to our community. The Ottawa Board of Trade is the voice of business and a key advocate for economic growth in our nation's capital. Our mission is to cultivate a thriving, world-class business community in Ottawa through leadership and partnerships. It is to that end that we are excited to welcome a panel of business and community leaders to discuss the priorities for the next term of council. We are excited to hear from Amy McLeod, who is the VP of Corporate Communications Corporate Communications at MDA, Cyril Leader, the CEO at Myers Automotive Group, Sarah Chown, who is the managing partner at Metropolitan Brasserie, and Aaron Benjamin, who is the president and CEO of the Canadian Live Music Association. As we kick off this breakfast, let's recognize the great businesses and organizations that support our speaker series. Our lead sponsor, Hydro Ottawa, Algonquin College, Commissioners Ottawa, Enbridge, The West in Ottawa, RBC, Rogers Communications, our global partner, Oakwood Designers and Builders, our gift, uh, our gift sponsor, Edmund, Edmund Harden, our coffee sponsor, Capital Office Interiors and Steelcase, and our breakfast sponsor, La Cité. A big thank you to all of these sponsors. Without you, our events would not be possible. Now please join me in warmly welcoming our Mayor, Mayor Jim Watson, to the podium for our City Hall update. Well, thank you very much, Su Ling. It looks great uh, to see uh, so many people come out uh, to support the Board of Trade and to hear from our distinguished panel in just a few moments. Alors, bienvenue à votre hôtel de ville. Welcome to your City Hall, and uh, thank you for um, allowing us to host this great breakfast series that's gone on for now back to my time when I was mayor in the 90s. So it's been quite a tradition, a great partnership with the Ottawa Business Journal as well, Michael. I want to honor uh, the land and the peoples of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose ancestors have lived on this territory for millennia and whose culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. Well, it's been a great summer so far, and our festivals and special events are starting to get back up and running, which is terrific. Our residents and visitors clearly miss these opportunities to get together with live music and celebrate. The local fall uh, fair season has kicked into high gear. We've already had the Navin Fair and the Capital Fair, and we have the Richmond Fair taking place this coming weekend. The Carp Fair follows from September 22nd to 25th, and the Metcalf Fair from September 29th to October 2nd. Not only is it fun for your kids to go out into the country, but it also highlights the importance of agriculture in the city of Ottawa and the fact that 82% of our land mass 
is green space and agricultural land. We have about 600 active farms, uh, everyone from uh, beekeepers to dairy, beef, uh, even uh, a cranberry patch uh, in Osgood Township. So it's a great opportunity to go out and support these fairs and rural and agricultural Ottawa. Children and youth have also uh, returned to school, including our post-secondary institutions, and we welcome back students to the, the nation's capital. They contribute uh, tremendously to the well-being of the local economy of our city. We don't know what the fall will bring on, on the COVID front, and we need to remain agile in case things take a turn for the worst. I certainly encourage everyone to get their COVID vaccine boosters so we can avoid a rise in severe cases. Anyone who wants a booster, just go to ottawa.ca and follow the link to Ottawa Public Health and it, it explains it very, very clearly. Now it's going to be an exciting and a very busy fall for our city. On top of everything else, municipalities across the province of Ontario will be holding elections on October 24th. We've added a new 24th ward this year, Barhaven East, because of the growth in that particular community. And I invite you to visit ottawa.ca to see if your ward has changed. As I mentioned, elections are going to be held on October 24th, but we have advanced voting on October 7th and 14th, and special ad advanced vote days from September 24th to 27th. You can find all of this information on ottawa.ca. Uh, even if you haven't received the black and white card, uh, you can still go and vote, and uh, we encourage you to do that because unfortunately even though our level of government touches people the most we have the lowest voter turnout which doesn't make a lot of sense whereas the federal government has the least impact on our, our lives uh, it has the highest voter turnout so we need to get more people out to vote uh, vote is your way of say, having your say in Ottawa's future and there are lots of significant municipal projects underway that will help shape our city for decades Stage two of LRT is progressing well, and planning for stage three is already underway to better serve Canada, Barhaven, and Stittsville, the fast-growing parts of our city. The Ottawa Hospital's new civic campus is closer to becoming a reality, and construction is started, or slated to start in 2024. The new hospital will help modernize healthcare in our region. Those of you who have been to the civic hospital, uh, it is quite a challenging building. It's been cobbled together over the years, and uh, when you see the plans for the new civic hospital, it should make you feel very, very proud as a citizen of this city. We also have the development at Le Breton Flats, a wonderful space with the potential to become an attractive community built around LRT, as there are two LRT stations that serve that area. A major sporting event center and other tourism assets, like the beautiful and inspiring new main branch of the Ottawa Public Library, which is under construction as we speak. And the Lansdowne Park revitalization is a huge deal. Anyone who was at City Folk saw what a great venue that is for those kinds of events. And we will hopefully, with the new council's approval, see new event spaces, housing, including affordable housing, and more retail space. These are really transformative projects that will change Ottawa. And I hope you ask candidates tough questions when they knock on the door this fall. We need to keep the, the city moving forward while keeping life affordable for residents. What other election priorities are at the heart of the business committees? Well, today we have four local CEOs with us to share their insight on the upcoming municipal election and its impact on the city. I very much look forward to this discussion, and I'll hand things back to Su Ling, and I thank Su Ling and the Board of Trade for being great partners, along with the OBJ. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Mayor Watson, for your comments. So as the mayor mentioned this fall, we all have an important role and responsibility to fulfill as we contemplate who will lead our city for the next four years. The results of the municipal election, which as you aptly said, is the closest to our everyday lives level of government, on October 24th will impact business and community success and set the direction for our collective future. To that end, the Board of Trade, as an independent, nonpartisan, and member-driven organization, has launched the Build Up Ottawa initiative, setting a pro-growth agenda that will create affordable, inclusive, and sustainable city. The last two years of change and challenge has revealed many lessons that can be leveraged as we grow forward. Business success drives community prosperity, and vice versa. Health drives the economy and vice versa. And we can accomplish much when we prioritize progress over perfection. We have an opportunity as individuals, as businesses, and as a community to grow, 
learn, and plan for a better future. One that requires the highest level of collaboration, innovation, and strategic investments. In this municipal election, we are seeking leaders who are committed to economic growth and who will create an environment that leverages the ingenuity and success of business to drive community prosperity. A thriving, world-class business community equals a strong and vibrant city for all. In the coming weeks, it is our intention to do three things. Share a growth-focused platform and look for alignment with all of the candidates. Engage candidates and the voting public in a discussion about our key priorities and cultivate a spirit of collaboration and progress that we can build on moving forward. In the end, we hope that together we will elect candidates that demonstrate they are future thinking visionaries, have a deep understanding for the citywide priorities that will make us competitive in a global economy and are committed to radical collaboration, working with all of council economic partners, and every level of government. In the last few months, we have been engaged with our members, business and community leaders, and stakeholders to identify five priorities that would form the basis of our Build Up Ottawa agenda and drive the conversations with our candidates. The first is to build for growth and support innovative in infrastructure. From finishing the LRT to supporting more direct flights at our airport, to investing in high-impact, world-class projects. Smart planning for infrastructure supports our climate and inclusivity goals while making the city more attractive to private sector investment, visitors, and talent. Secondly, build more homes. Increase the accessibility and affordability of homes, first by streamlining development processes, removing barriers and incentivizing strategic city building to increase inventory and positively impact the market pricing of homes. Second, by advocating for adequate funding to build housing that addresses the growing demands for people and families who require social support. Third, build business confidence. Commit to moderate and preset tax increases for four years to help businesses address rising costs and inspire business confidence, innovation, and predictability. Focus in on efficiency, service excellence, and economic development investments for long-term sustainable growth. Many local businesses are recovering and adjusting to our new economic realities. It is imperative that they know our city intends to create a competitive business environment. Their success is our success. Next, Build better health. Advocate for and support the new campus development at the Ottawa Hospital, a state-of-the-art healthcare facility to ensure our growing population is well-served and healthy, while attracting businesses and residents that are seeking these amenities. Building a healthy, resilient city is an economic imperative, and time is of the essence. And lastly, build small business. Advocate and support policies and programs that directly impact businesses in the hardest hit sectors and diverse businesses, those owned by women, indigenous, racialized entrepreneurs, people with disabilities, and those who are part of the LGBTQ2S plus community. Small businesses are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. They are the heart of our culture and our economy the their entrepreneurial spirit, spirit must be protected. It is our hope that you can see the future of our capital city in these highlights and that you will get involved in creating our future. Encourage residents and business leaders to build up Ottawa and ask candidates about their key priorities to keep Ottawa growing. You can stay connected and informed through our website, buildupottawa.ca, and our newsletters. You will notice an extensive media plan being executed through your favorite media outlets, and we hope that you will join us on September 23rd for an all-candidates meet and greet, where you can network with candidates and business leaders and learn more about some of our, most, our highest impact projects and industries. Stay tuned for details about a mayoral debate and save the date for the evening of October 12th. Please consider sharing our agenda within your network. We are making it easy with tools such as social shareables, a poster that can be displayed at your business or workplace, and we even have one of those little frames that you can put around your face on your social profiles, one that says Build Up Ottawa. 
Lastly, we ask you to stand up for Ottawa and exercise your democratic right by making an informed vote on October 24th. Encourage others to do the same and engage in the Build Up Ottawa agenda leading up to and post-election day. Now is the time to be bold and build up Ottawa as a model of leadership for generations to come and for the world to see. We must seize this opportunity to create a vision and work together to build an affordable, inclusive, and sustainable city. Finally, I wish to acknowledge all of the candidates for their commitment to our city and willingness to serve as a member of City Council. This is a courageous choice, and we are dedicated to working closely with these community leaders to ensure Ottawa reaches its full potential as the best capital city in the world. Now, let's hear from some of Ottawa's top business and community leaders about what they are looking for in the next term of council. Please welcome to the podium Michael Curran, along with his panelists, Amy McLeod, Sarah Schoen, Cyril Leader, and Aaron Benjamin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here in, uh, in such big numbers. It's like there's an important thing happening in our city this fall, the election, of course, and uh, everyone seems to be tuned in. So if I were to summarize our goal in just a few words, it's really this. Uh, throughout the campaign, there will be ma many uh, interests put forward during the election. So really our goal today is to, is to bring forward what are the business community's interests or more uh, succinctly saying, uh, what does the business community want from a new mayor and new city council? And to answer some of those questions, we've assembled a panel of people uh, that we believe represents the broader business community. Of course, it's hard to uh, represent all of the interests and all of the different aspects of the community, but I think we've got some great people up here on the stage. So without further ado, we're going to launch right into things. And maybe what I'll ask of our panelists, and we'll start with you, Erin, we'll work our, our way down the, uh, the table. Maybe give a, just a quick introduction for about 20 seconds. But more specifically, let's uh, take the temperature, so to speak, in your industry. It's been a very challenging economic time when I think of you and your industry, live music, Erin, that's particularly true. So give us a quick intro, but also what is happening in your business sector. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for inviting live music to this particular table. I have been on the uh, Board of Trade uh, Board of Directors for a couple of years now. It's been an excellent experience getting to know the local business community uh, more closely, and I really appreciate this opportunity this morning. Nice to see you all. I think this is my first in-person panel in a very long time, so I'm feeling a little rusty, but... Um, the Canadian Live Music Association represents the industry side of the sector, so concert promoters, festivals, venues, performing arts centers, uh, uh, and the supply chain. For example, our Ottawa members would include the National Arts Center, Blues Fest, Live on Elgin, Ottawa Sports and Entertainment Group, that sort of thing. So, uh, and I also enjoy sitting on the uh, the. Um, the board of the Ottawa Film Commission as well, so um, I bring a little bit of that perspective with me today. So it will come as no surprise to you that the global concert industry lost um, upwards of $9 billion over the course of the last couple of years, not to mention huge chunks of our cultural infrastructure, iconic venues, um, artists whose uh, careers never even had a chance to get started, and we saw a massive exodus of skilled labor and workers as people sought to uh, employment elsewhere. So today is a bit of a different story, finally, um, and there is some good news. The shows that you'd expect to see sell out are selling out. Um, big names, big business, right? That you all can name some of those artists. Um, Live Nation, our, our largest member, for example, is reporting a 30% increase in ticket sales around the world, and that's up from 2019, so that's incredible. On-site purchasing, another really important number, is up 20% for some of those shows. So that's food and beverage, merch, that means that there's some extra income there. And projections are that 20 million, I'm sorry, 200 million concert tickets will be sold worldwide by the end of 2022. So globally, big shows are back, and for the most part, they're performing very well. But beyond the biggest shows, um, some challenges, consumer hesitancy, 
persists uh, seem to be, um, you know, that seems to be directly aligned with programming. No surprise to any of you, different cohorts are responding differently. Uh, younger folks are more likely to go to a show, older folks are not. Inflation uh, is really spreading that concert dollar very thinly and there is a massive amount of inventory in market right now. So fans have a lot of choice and not everyone as a result is winning. Um, and for what tickets they are buying, they're now buying very last minute, making it much, much harder for venues to plan. So when you sell 20 tickets online um, in advance and then you have 200 people show up at the door on the day of, um, how many staff do you have on? How much, how much beer do you have in your fridge? Um, this never used to happen, very different situation. Season and series ticket subscribers, some of you may be in the room. These are way down across the board, unfortunately. That was a model that was um, beginning to wear uh, with aging demographics, of course, but in some cases, subscription sales are down 40 to 50 percent. So think about the performing arts centers who are dealing with that challenge. Travel chaos. I'm going to whip through some of this, Michael, I promise. Travel chaos is wreaking havoc on touring. So a number of international tours have been rescheduled to, again, to 2023 as a result. Um, inflation means higher costs of touring when there were incredibly thin margins already. And almost three years in, I would say that organizations and most certainly artists are still reducing their revenue goals, unfortunately. Um, to, just, to, just to sum this up, I, I would say that in addition to all of these challenges, though, um, there are an incredible number of silver linings and opportunities. The economic benefits of live music, the way that our sector helps to drive the tourism economy and the nighttime economy, um, uh, these are, are becoming much better understood by government. Investments in things like local music strategy, music city strategies, which Ottawa already has. It could probably use a bit of a dust off now, but we do have one. Um, these are becoming more commonplace. Um, the, you know, the integration of fiscal, economic, and cultural policy. So all in all, I would say it's a really exciting time to be a part of the creative economy as we help to hasten recovery, you know, city brand building, quality of life, vibrant neighborhoods, downtown revitalization. These are all outcomes, I think, of clear strategic integration of live music into progressive municipal planning. Thank, thanks, Aaron. Very uh, topsy-turvy time for uh, the music industry. and. I think we can, through your comments, we can even think about how music it goes beyond your industry to city building, as you say, and and uh, so on and so forth. You're reminding me I'm going to the Eagles tonight, by the way. So just got excited. Put up that. your hand if you're going to the Eagles. Oh, we're going to talk later, Fred. <laughs> you're going to regret not being there. I'll give you that much. So a little bit of a segue there, uh, Cyril. I don't know if Cyril needs to introduce himself. A man that wears many hats in the in uh, the city and, and won't speak to live music probably could uh cyril uh, the know. beer fridge was always full i gotta oh, say that okay. okay regardless of how many people were showing up at the door the beer fridge was stacked yeah. um so cyril as i said you, you wear many hats today uh one of those of course is ceo of myers group and just as it's been topsy-turvy in the music industry holy cow topsy-turvy when you're trying to sell cars these days yeah, we, we were, I think, though, one of the fortunate industries, automotive retail, we, we were an essential service during the pandemic, so we were open, continuous throughout, so uh, while we had our challenges, uh, we were able to stay open and adapt and had the opportunity to operate fully. Uh, right now, the issue in the automotive uh, industry is supply chain logistics. I could spend the next hour explaining that to everybody here, but uh, trust me when I tell you that getting the cars from the factory to the consumer is, is an issue right now, and it's a major issue. Uh, just to give you some idea of the scope, uh, in Canada in 2019, the last full year before the pandemic, we would have sold in this country 2 million new cars, 1.99 million new cars. This year, if we're lucky, the dealers and manufacturers will sell 1.4 million, so about 70% of normal volume. That's the lowest number of cars in more than 25 years in a long time and it's 13% um, it's less than last year. So problem's getting worse, not better. And if that's not enough, uh, we're, you know, we're dealing with the supply chain logistics and trying to get production back to normal. The automotive retail industry is on the cusp of the most significant disruption and uh, change to the business since Henry Ford uh, invented the assembly line in 1913. So we're just about to, and I'm talking of course about the advent of electric vehicles and a move to digital retailing. 
So I, I would, I would s surmise that this group in this room, if, if you are a two-car family like we are, um, by 2026, one of those cars will be electric. Um, and if you buy it in 2025 or 2026, it's probably going to buy it online. Not everybody will buy it online, but likely to buy that online. So if you like uh, excitement, disruption, constantly changing, automotive retail is the place to be right now. I hope you people are sleeping at night. Yeah. And you're reminding me of winning my RAV4 hybrid, Cyril. So We're working you. on that. Yeah. We're working on that. Each of you are reminding me of something that relates back to my life. But, it, but again, Cyril, you know, um, you think of the retail automotive industry and how many people it employs. But, you know, inherent in your story, too, is that story of um, the supply chain disruption, right, which many industries are, yeah. are dealing with still. We're going to go to Sarah. And Sarah, wow, topsy-turvy again is a common theme for sure. Sarah, you're representing a little bit of the restaurant and hospitality uh, industry here. Um, share a little bit about yourself and tell us about uh, what's happening at Metropolitan Brasserie. Um, I don't think I have to explain to you all what we've been through in the last two plus years. Um, our sector took a massive hit, uh, continues to do so. Um, our numbers versus 2019 are still down significantly for the majority of our sector. Um, that goes for hotels, motels, as well as restaurants. Um, we rely heavily on tourism, we rely heavily on convention business, all of which has been severely lacking. Um, as you all know, the downtown core took an exponential hit this winter uh, when we had our friends in town that visited us for just about a month. Um, so those of us that had businesses downtown were closed for an additional close to a month after everyone else opened um, in late February. So. That was extremely tough for all of us. So on top of all of that, we have a number of other issues that continue to affect us. Supply chain issues, like Sai mentioned, also affect us. So you think about getting product in from Europe, wine, things like that, as well as food products have also gone up exponentially in price. So pricing continues to be a problem for us. And then staffing as well, like Aaron mentioned, is a big problem for our industry. Immigration affects all of us when it comes to hotel employment. Think about the people that are working the front desk and are cleaning your rooms when we're not bringing people into this country to work we're continuing to lack bringing in new staff to employ people in terms of last minute bookings Aaron mentioned when people are walking up to the door looking for last minute tickets well it's the same in the restaurant industry so if you're calling a restaurant on a Thursday and you're looking for a booking for 25 people on Saturday night odds are that that's not going to be able to happen for you because for us making those last minute calls for staff and getting them in to serve you last minute is just simply not something we're capable of doing at this point so I implore all of you to keep that in mind when you're trying to book things last minute, make plans well in advance. Um, hoping the fall brings us some more convention business downtown. Um, things are looking good for a number of people that have larger spaces to accommodate groups like that. Um, but a lot of us in the back of our minds also have what's in store for us in the fall and winter in terms of staffing and in terms of potential restrictions. Really hoping that doesn't come to fruition, but that's sort of where our minds are at. It's always in the back of our heads what's around the corner. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Amy, we're going to go to you next. And, you know, when I think of the local economy, certainly one of those giant pillars is the technology sector. Mm -hmm. You're here wearing that hat today. You've spent many years as an executive in the technology sector, particularly advocating on behalf of Canada North uh, Business Association on its board of directors. Tech topsy-turvy always, as you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it was kind of a beneficiary, if I were to generalize, early in the pandemic. A lot of us turned to digital channels, you know, think of the, the boom that Shopify experienced or even Canaxis out there in Canada. So there's, there was some real silver linings in the pandemic. But now we're into maybe a little bit of different period with different valuations around tech companies, uh, a dip in technology uh, stocks, the valuation of technology stocks. Tell us more about what you think is happening in the local tech sector. Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. And just even before I get started, thank you, Su Ling, for pulling us together. Uh, one of the outcomes of the pandemic is I don't get out of the house very often, so it's just really nice to be with people and to be back down in the downtown core. And, and a special thank you to you, Mr. Mayor. You have been a huge supporter and advocate of the uh, innovation in the tech economy in Ottawa, 
and a, and a partner in helping us grow and sustain it here. And as you go on to your next journey, I just wanted to say thank you. It is noted and appreciated. And I think we're going to talk a little bit later about you know, what we hope from the next council and the next mayor. And a little bit more of the same would be a very good start. But that, to your question, Michael, yeah, we, we relative to some of the other sectors, the innovation economy in, uh, in Ottawa and elsewhere uh, was able to manage through the pandemic uh, relatively well. Not without impact for sure, but compared to hospitality or uh, automotive or entertainment, we could all pretty much still go to work. Sometimes from the laundry room, which was where I've been for two and a half years, but managing. Uh, the challenge for us is different at this point, and it's the, the, the primary challenge is uh, the hunt for global talent. And it's not dissimilar to the supply chain challenges, where you have got to hunt every single day. Growth is happening, every business, I would uh, assume even uh, a restaurant business, has a digital footprint. And so we're drawing on a lot of the same skills globally in order to accommodate the growth in, in, in the innovation economy and the digital economy. And, uh, and Ottawa is very fortunate. We have one of the, we have the largest uh, tech community in Canada. It's based in Canada North, but it's scattered across uh, the city and highly competitive, innovative companies on a worldwide scale. We need people. That is the raw resource that fuels our sector. And increasingly, those folks have choices, always did, but more so post-pandemic as bricks and mortar is less of a need. And people can uh, really make choices on where they work, distant and dim different from where they live. And that's the challenge that we're facing here. We want to keep this great innovation economy in Ottawa. We do think it's a net contributor uh, to, the, to the community, both economically and socially and culturally. Um, but we, we are hunting for talent every single day. In Canada North, I believe we have 1,400 job racks open now that we have to look beyond Ottawa to fill. We cannot do it from within. And so that's the, a little bit of a different challenge. Uh, a silver lining for sure as it relates to the ability to sustain and maintain business through the pandemic. But keeping it here in a, in, a, in a global economy that's hunting for the very talent that we, that we have and that you know, good friends at Carleton and Algonquin and UO are producing um, brilliantly, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the wave we're facing right now. Yeah. It, it will be absolutely fascinating to see how talent plays out. You're right. Uh, it's always been a global uh, talent pool, but now with tech companies just hiring people from all around the world, I know that existed before, but it will that will accelerate and it'll be interesting how that translates to technology jobs in, in our city. Um, we're going to move to our second question and we're going to continue to ask uh, or answer, excuse me, the question from your particular sector. So you might be a little bit different from this. So the question is, if you had one ask of the next uh, new mayor and city council, what would it be? So Aaron, we're gonna go from you. What would the arts committee, the general arts community, or more specifically the live music community want from city hall and a new mayor? Okay, so I have two. I know, but I, okay, I have, I have, I have, I have part A and part B of one. Um, first, I, I, I have to give a shout out um, to Mayor Watson and my councilor, Jeff Leeper. Michael Crockett and Matt Gravel and a bunch of other people who have really prioritized and music and understood the value of a local live music economy. Um, and I hope that together we can continue to build on that. Um, so thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I think my overarching theme, Michael, is collaboration. Um, uh, to borrow from Su Ling and the work of the Board of Trade, I think big picture we need to absolutely, and we heard this earlier, ensure projects like Le Breton and Lansdowne um, are moving forward, uh, policy work around music city strategies, the nightlife economy strategy, which is somewhere in the pipeline, needs to make sure these remain front and center. Uh, we need to recognize how deeply intersectional our industry is, and I can call it entertainment, I can call it live music, I can call it arts and culture, I can call it sports and entertainment, um, how deeply intersectional our industry is to the future economic success of this city. 
Our ticket holders will have dinner downtown. They're going to take a cab. They'll probably stay in a hotel. They might fly into the city. They could shop in the Byward Market. They're going to talk about their experiences that they have in Ottawa. They are going to put Ottawa on the map. And I really would encourage New Marin Council to look at sports, entertainment, culture, live events with some fresh eyes. So. Uh, but my, the part B of this is in the short term, I would, and I would love to work with you on this, I think we need to take a very hard look at some of the red tape, bylaw, permitting. I hear from some of our small business owners in the live music space about the frustrating lack of administrative cohesion and coordination, making it very difficult to do business um, to a certain extent. So I think we're leaving a lot on the table in terms of potential. Um, you know, for some reason, we can't make it even more simple to park a tour bus outside of a venue um, for an hour. And, uh, and we want to help figure this piece out. And that's just one simple example of many I could give you. So I think collaboration will be key to the future council and mayor's ability to leverage the kind of value that live music, sports, and entertainment can really bring to this city. That's, that's great. OK, so there was part of an answer was general infrastructure, transportation, yep. you know, the LRT and bus system, uh, just that tourism experience thing focused on that, but also some logistical things around planning events and folding live music. Absolutely, and understanding, I think, that there are so many layers to an amazing, uh, well-functioning city, and the layer that we represent can be, like, the potential here can be mined much more deeply. I think we've made a really good start and some good investments and some interesting policy advancements, but we have a lot, I think there's just, there's a long way to go, and, 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 and that'll take us in the right direction. Really interesting. And, and Sai, again, I, I'm repeating myself, but you wear many hats. So I'm eager to hear what you have to say. So what would you ask of a new mayor and new city council? Yeah, I, I think my ask would be to, to just to have a plan, like I have a really well thought out plan for prosperity. How, how do we get to where we're going? Just don't charge into a new four year mandate without having that, that plan well thought out. And you know, a couple of the elements you'd want to see in that plan really, we've talked a bit about them today, are a focus on major projects, how are we delivering Le Breton? How are we going to, what are we going to do for the Byward Market, the new Civic Hospital, and development around the LRT nodes? Like, that's got to be a real integral part of that plan. Um, you want to have a focus on tourism as well. I, I, I've always been a proponent of tourism. Every time we bring a dollar into the city, that, that's a really important dollar. So bringing those dollars from outside into our city, uh, we've made great progress as, you know, kind of marketing our capital before the pandemic hit. We kind of lost a bit of that momentum. So I'd really have a focus on tourism. We're a G7 capital city, and there's lots of runway there, I think, on the tourism front. And, and along Aaron's line, just allow businesses to help themselves. So, so you, you allow us to have their own, our, to deliver on our growth strategies and our growth plans. Make it easier for us to do what we've got to do. Um, my own personal example, uh, I'm sure a lot of the businesses in this room uh, have the same, would share in the same example, and it's not easy to do. It's, it's an easy to say, but not easy to do. You know, we, we're in front of council all the time, planning committee with new projects. We're building dealerships, we're moving dealerships, we're starting new ones, we're renovating, always getting plans. And from the time we deliver the full package, so all the architectural plans, the engineering plans, the transportation studies, environmental impact, we deliver the plans, we hand them to the city. It's nine months later, we'll be in a position to, to move forward. That's too long. Okay, nine months, we could build the dealership in less than nine months, so we, we, need, to, we need to shorten that window. Again, easier said than done, um, but the cities that get that right are the ones that are going to prosper and have the leg up and will move forward in the future. So that's really important to, to get that right. And of course, I don't want my taxes to go up. So. <laughs> So again, this is great stuff, uh, everyone. So I heard that the, uh, from your perspective, you want, uh, the business committee wants to know if there's a business plan around major projects. Yeah. I, clarity around that. Yeah, would, you have the plan to deliver on those projects. If you get those projects right, you know, we're gonna go a long way to Sue Ling's message of having a vibrant, uh, uh, inclusive, sustainable, prosperous city. If we get those major projects right. And I heard the tourism point, it's a great one. When we bring a tourist to town, that's an additional dollar that wasn't in our economy. So that lifts us all up. And then your final point, similar to Aaron, 
was around the internal mechanics of what happens at City Hall, around yeah. bylaw issues for your case, land development. Land development, bylaw, it's the same, the same issues. Just okay. make, make it easier for businesses to, to help themselves. Okay. We don't need tax breaks. We don't need uh, you know, free services. We think we're paying our share now, but we, we, don't, we don't need free tax breaks. We just need to help us help ourselves. Excellent. And Sarah, let's go to you. So uh, wearing your restaurant, hospitality, downtown, at your, you're bringing all those interests here. What would you ask of a new mayor and new city council? Yeah, I would definitely amplify the message of my two colleagues here. Um, tourism, cutting the red tape are exactly the things that were on my mind and continuing to help us amplify our message with other levels of government, working together and uh, sorry, collaborating. Um, there have been some good things that have come out of this and our work together with the city and a number of partners that we wouldn't normally have gotten together and worked with and I would really hope that things like that continue. Um, many of you may not know but Sue Ling and I sit on the Mayor's Economic Task Force so we are a group that gets together once a month of um, you know, people from different sectors that have been highly affected and we put our minds together for about an hour and we discuss different problems that are happening to us in our sectors and creative ways that maybe we can work together or that the city can help us to help those problems and how they can help amplify our message to different levels of government. And that is something that we need to continue. We talked about this in our last meeting, but this is something that's been very helpful to us and I would really hope would continue on. But um, to size point, tourism is really where my mind went when you originally asked this question was that is a major part of what drives our businesses, the hotels and the restaurants and the downtown core. And we need to differentiate ourselves from other cities and get creative with some new and innovative ideas on how we can bring that business back to Ottawa. Okay, wonderful. So uh, another vote for tourism and what I'm hearing is, uh, and Suling has referenced this many times, I think during the pandemic, there was a tightness, there was a collaboration between the business community and City Hall to listen to each other, to, to communicate and identify some priorities. So you want, you certainly want that to continue. And uh, let's go to you, Amy. You know, again, the tourism, uh, sorry, the technology sector, I meant to say, is, is all often very different. But when you think of a new mayor and new city council, what would generally the technology sector be looking for? Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting just sitting here, uh, the fourth on this question, and uh, recognizing how similar yeah. all of our requests are, even though we're from profoundly different sectors of the Ottawa-based economy. Um, and, and so it's a little bit more of the same. Certainly, uh, you know, connect us, both physically with transportation and uh, as a community as we did in the pandemic. I think getting to know us in the, in the innovation economy and, uh, and the tech sector is really important. I do feel sometimes that municipal government thinks that's somebody else's jurisdiction and it's a really important part of our local economy and a big part of the growth uh, opportunity that we have. So, so that would be one. But just reflecting on, on the comments, um, uh, Harness the lessons learned from the pandemic, and I think if I were to summarize that, and, and I'm super proud of the way that Ottawa and Canada responded to this horrible couple of years that we've lived through. We responded with the speed of need, right? We, there was a need, and we, and we addressed it. And, and it was big and small. It was vaccines and, and, the, and, the, and the rollout of vaccines at a scale we could never have anticipated or planned for. But it was also small in the sense of, um, restaurants needing additional outdoor space, we can, we can verge onto the sidewalks. Small things that, that were planning issues that got out of the way that allowed business to happen. It's the same in the large uh, innovation economy as well. This, the need for speed, there's nothing static in innovation. You can't wait 12 months, it's going to change. And so the opportunity to build that growth mindset and that plan requires speed. And, uh, and we saw what we, or I saw what we could do through the pandemic when we needed to. And so it's more an ask about coming into this next mandate with that attitude. How fast can we go? Instead of uh, perhaps the more traditional approach to, to engagement with the business sector. That would be, uh, that would be a, a big improvement. I would also ask the, the council and, and the mayor um, to really see Ottawa as an ecosystem that feeds each other. 
The tech workers eat at Sarah's restaurant, go to the events and concerts, buy cars, right? We're all the same and I, 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 we're all contributing to the same economy, even if it's from different perspectives. And I do feel that at times we are siloed and not, not, we don't look at each other as one ecosystem. We talk about ecosystems endlessly in the tech space because one part feeds the next and one piece of innovation drives the next innovation and it's the same in the economy locally and, and I think uh, if, we, if we can come in with that sort of perspective and mindset, um, we're going to benefit. Okay, good, good stuff and I'm picking up on that speed comment. You need a city council and a mayor that is responding with some degree of speed. We're trying to innovate, we're trying to stay on the cusp of, uh, of technology innovation, so that's great. We're doing well on time, but I'll ask each of you to uh, stay somewhat succinct. Our, our final question is uh, thinking broadly, and, and to be honest, I think all of you have thought fairly broadly in your answers so far, but what advice would you give to the new mayor? So if you were to sit down on, uh, let's say it's December, January, and you were to give the mayor some new advice, what advice would that be, Aaron? because I will be doing that. Okay, it's coming, be warned. It's a heads up. Uh, okay, so um, uh, uh, it's, it's, I think it's the theme of, of today and that is uh, collaboration, to collaborate. I think one example uh, is the saving of the Rainbow Bistro, right? Are many of you familiar with how that went down? Uh, just an incredible story as uh, the, the, uh, the beloved Rainbow was saved from the jaws of COVID by some local business leaders, I might even say legends at this point. Um, and it's a really great example when we think of the kind of city we wanna live in. You know, the moral of that story, I think is that we all need to take responsibility, um, take the responsibility we each have to go beyond what we thought we knew. I think COVID has taught us that. We need to actively seek out the unusual suspects and be open to working together in maybe unusual ways. Uh, Ottawa has the assets and the incredible leadership in this sector already and without question we can and we should be I think one of the greatest live event destinations in Canada if not the world and as Su Ling says radical collaboration is what is going to get us there and I will conclude these comments by saying that over the last two and a half years I have spent more time working with travel, tourism, hospitality and the other live event organizations I've spoken I've spent way more time with the airlines on the phone with the airlines than Live Nation uh, trying to figure our way out of this mess because we have so many common goals and we stand on common ground we face common challenges and if it wasn't I would never would have I don't know if they're here today but Beth Potter from the Tourism Industry Association of Canada Susie Grinnell from the Hotel Association of Canada the leadership through the Coalition for the Hardest Hit Businesses if it wasn't for those types of collaborations the Canadian Tourism Travel Roundtable um, that uh, I've met some of the most incredible leadership, some of the brightest minds, some of the most passionate, resilient people, and they taught me that collaborating with some of the most unusual suspects, people I never would have met if it hadn't been the, for the pandemic, um, have enabled me to lead our sector through this. And so this is my message to the future council and mayor. Look to the unusual suspects and build those collaborations because as Amy just said, the ecosystem here is what feeds us all, absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, what sage advice, Cyril, would you give to the mayor? I use one of my f sports analogies. It used to be a great saying around Michael Jordan, uh, be like Mike. So I just say, be like Jim. <laughs> that would be my advice. Um, it's actually a, a chance for me to give a shout out to, to Jim. Uh, I may not get another chance publicly to just thank him for the great service. We've been fortunate as a city to have 12 great years of your leadership. You've, been, you've done it with uh, great integrity, you were hardworking, uh, credible, great leader for our city. We, we could not have asked for more for, for our mayor for the past 12 years, so thank you for all that. And, and for our incoming mayor and, and really for the council, I would say you know, take a business approach to running the city. It's the biggest entity in the region. It, it really is. It, it needs that business approach. Um, to, to get it right, uh, have that plan for success, plan for prosperity, and you know, follow the, the in order who, uh, what, and how. You know, sort of the, the who is your team. So the mayor can't do it himself, the council can't do it themselves. They need a, a great team 
So make sure you got the right people in place, okay, the, the right professionals, um, the, the administrators, the engineers, the planners, that's really important. Get your team right. So you know, the business approach is who first, then what. So get the who part right, then what. You know, again, focus on those major projects. Uh, if you get them right, you get La Breton Flats, the Byward Market, I'm repeating myself, but um, the Haas Civic, Haas New Civic, and the development around the, the LRT nodes, you will have gone a long way. And we call those the big rocks in business. You get the, I think that's a Stephen Covey analogy, get the big rocks right, and then everything else will kind of take care of itself. And then after you got the who and the what, it's the how, which is really the, the art of the business. You know, the really the hard part is how do you deliver that? Um, and you need the right foundation as, as a city. And that foundation is going to include some of the things we talked about already. Um, ability to have affordable homes. I'm, and I'm not just talking about subsidized housing. That's important as well. I'm talking about the ability for couples in their 20s to own and buy their own home. My wife and I, we were both working. We were able to do it. Our kids were able to do it, but I don't know if you can do that now in, in Ottawa. So we've lost that edge. We, we need to get that back. Um, next part of that foundation is your transportation network. We've talked about that. There's lots of elements of transportation network, and you've got to get it all right. Okay, it's, it's not just about buses. It's not just about LRT. There's cars. There's bikes. It's all got to work. So you've got to get that network done properly. Then there's the governance aspect. So people ask me all the time, you know, how do, you, how do I build my personal brand? How do I build my brand for my business? That's what good governance really does. It's just making the right decision every time. It's not easy to do. So, and sometimes the easy decision is not the right decision. And in politics, sometimes the one that carries the most political favor is not always the right decision. So you've got to make those right decisions. That's what good governance is all about. Got to get that right. And lastly is you know, value for services. You know, the budget of the city is huge. And you really got to get value for your operating, the services you provide on a regular basis, and on the capital projects that you're, you're spending your money on. You got to get full value for those. Again, easier said than done, but that would be my advice to the new council. Take a, a real true business approach to running the city. That's great advice. Sarah, over to you. Um. You've picked up on a lot of the points I was going to mention, so I'm going to go off the cuff here and think of something a little bit different from more of a council perspective. Um, I would really encourage folks to listen and continue to work together, like Aaron said. The city is huge. Each council has its own ward, but you need to remember that we are one city as a whole, and the downtown is very important, so remember that the downtown business may employ your child that lives in Stittsville or you know your neighbor who lives in Orleans and just remember that we are one city as a whole and continue to listen to the business community and listen to your counselors and work together to make the right choices. Okay, that's awesome, yeah. thank you. And Amy, last word goes to you and I do appreciate it, it gets more difficult as everyone else it does. answers it the does. question ahead of you. Everything that needs to be said has been said, but I would, I, I would say this um, for, for the incoming mayor and the council, um, be on our team, right? See yourself as part of the business community, not a, an elected representative that is distant and, and separate from that. We see you as part of our team. And so be on our team uh, is, is one request. Get to know us, which I think is what Sarah was just saying. Uh, come visit us, understand our business. If I can figure it out, anybody can. Uh, and so there, there's just make the effort to get to know the businesses, large and small, and the, and the challenges and opportunities that we're facing, because they're, they're huge and they're persistent and they're ever always going to be there. Um, and, and we welcome you to come and get to know us and be on our team. And then I'm going to steal a, a line from Suling's opening, which I think is a great framework for, for me. Um, drive progress, not perfection. Don't wait for perfect. Business is about taking risks, calculated, manageable, smart risk, but that's the world we live in in the business sector. And, and so if, if the council and the mayor has that frame of uh, reference also, I, I think we can, we can do some interesting, great things for Ottawa as a whole. Big round of applause for our business panel.
And, uh, and I'll, uh, we'll wrap up the event in just about two or three minutes. I'll just ask you to hang out just there, uh, as opposed to creating some, co uh, some commotion. And I'm going to ask uh, Nagin Yazdani from Eamon Harden to come forward to present a, some uh, speaker gifts. And here she, here she comes. Thanks to Eamon Harden for sponsoring our speaker gifts. Of course, Eamon Harden is a local management side employment law firm that's dispensed amazing uh, advice, hopefully to some of you in the audience uh, during the pandemic on the very complicated world of employment law in the uh, pandemic. So thank you very much uh, to Eamon Harden. Uh, as uh, those are being handed out, let me give you a little bit of an OBJ update. We have our fall issue of our news magazine. Yes, we still print a newspaper. Uh, that's coming out in early October, and the cover story will be CEO of the Year. So we are very happy to announce our CEO of the Year, along with the Board of Trade, last week, uh, Kyle Bratz of Fullscript, uh, a uh, remarkable young man. I say young man because he's still, believe it or not, under 40. So uh, remarkable that he's uh, getting that type of recognition at such a young age. A local product, if I could say that, a graduate of Telfer uh, School of Business and a remarkable business. If you haven't read about Fullscript, you certainly will. Re received hundreds of millions in venture capital, uh, almost at a thousand employees right now, working many of our, like many of our global uh, tech companies around the world. So please stay tuned for that issue. Uh, also, I wanted to tease a uh, a virtual event that OBJ's uh, involved in. We started this a few years ago. Ottawa is full, I'm sure you've noticed, of associations. We are, and Aaron, you're, you're an example of that. In fact, sometimes I think we're an associate, association city, and we don't always appreciate that. So a few years ago, we created something called OAX, the Otis Association Exchange. Effectively, we do a bunch of research using David Coletto on best practices for association leaders. We identify what's happening, and we pr publish a report. So we're releasing that a report in a virtual event on Thursday, October 13th. Uh, timing is 1 to 3.15, so it doesn't take very long. Uh, and the theme is a bright future, how associations are remarking, remaking themselves. And uh, I think Francis Moran or Richard McNeil, one of you is in the room here today. There's Francis right there if you turn around. So uh, if you want more information on the virtual event, go see Francis. You'll have to take a little bit of a walk, but you'll get there. <laughs> Thanks, Francis, uh, for that. A few Ottawa business events uh, coming up. I just talked about the best, uh, the CEO of the year. That is part of the Best Ottawa Business Awards Awards program. Nominations are still open uh, for uh, in many categories, including best business, best new business, best performance categories, so on and so forth. You can go to bestottawabusiness.ca, bestottawabusiness.ca to submit your nomination. The Talent Summit, Amy was just talking about talent and will be in fact in Canada to talk about talent on uh, a Tuesday, October 4th. Uh, so a full day conference uh, devoted to talent, taking many different perspective, uh, perspectives from uh, diversity and equity to engagement, to workplace 2.0, uh, legal issues, oh my gosh, immigration, uh, tapping into uh, maybe uh, underrepresented parts of the employer uh, labor force. So it's a great event. It's coming up on Tuesday, October 4th. Again, it's called the Ottawa Talent Summit. The second time we've done it in person. We did it in 2019 and we did it virtually and we're back to in person. So we're at Brook Street Hotel right in the heart of Canada North. Uh, you can check out ottawabot.ca. Call the Rogers TV Viewer Response Line. Email us or connect with us on social media. This is Rogers TV. October 5th, 2014, my daughter was hit by a train. She was walking along the sides of the tracks and it shattered her world. <laughs> And he fell. <laughs> Whoa, I'm not driving. I'm way too stoned. How are you feeling, Veer? Oh, since we had that talk, I'm not driving tonight at all. What, what about, about you, Dave? You only had a couple of drinks. And only a couple of puffs. I don't drink and drive. No way I'm getting behind the wheel when I smoked weed, too. How are we getting home, then? You can drive, Dave. Come on, Dave. Take one for the team, buddy. Don't let...